All right. Okay, so I think we can better. start. Yeah. Yes? So hi, everyone, and thank you for going all the way down here and finding this remote room and joining us for what we hope will be a very interesting and lively discussion. This is definitely the best session because while in the other rooms they're talking about technologies, we're going to be talking about the analysis, which is, you know, like where, where the interesting stuff happens. Um, so we're looking forward to a lot of comments and a lot of participation from everybody. Um, so we'll do I have something for the presentation? Or? Oh, there's a... Is it this? I think... Yeah, 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 oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 you can use mine or... Yeah. Uh. Oh, there we go, okay. Um, so we just put together like three small slides to kind of start the discussion and then really whatever comes from you will we'll be happy to talk about. Um, so welcome to the Spatial Imaging Processing and Data Integration uh, session. My name is Liat Karen. I'm at Stanford University. I'm sorry for I accidentally left the Stanford logo in the presentation, but it's not associated with Stanford. Um, and GC, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm uh, GC Yuan. I'm a computational biologist Dana Faber, and uh, my work is mainly focused on the uh, gene regulation uh, cancer and diseases. Okay, um, and so I think everybody here, and, and this is following the session this morning, is, uh, is interested in tissue structure and how, you know, single cell data and phenotypes kind of come together in a structure, because really it's these multicellular structures that eventually guide a composite response, and they also feed back into the, the phenotypes of the single cells that we see. And, now, and so I think this is really what kind of brings us together and what we're interested in here. And so multiplexed imaging um, if, or, or is kind of a broad name, I think, for many approaches like we've seen this morning. With the idea is that you can get some sort of measurements, more quantitative, less quantitative, more resolution, less resolution, but some kind of measurements of expression of either proteins or mRNAs within the context of the tissue. And really, I think um, in the last couple of years, we've seen an explosion of methodologies um, to measure these uh, expression, ranging from in situ sequencing to cyclic fluorescent to metal labeled probes for measuring antibodies, measuring proteins, measuring mRNA. And these are just a few, and there are much more. Um, and really, what um, I think is really lacking currently in the field is, is analysis um, uh, for all of these approaches. And, and what people are currently doing is kind of, you know, the, the really most basic. And, and I apologize if anybody's using a method <laughs> that I f didn't put on this slide. You know, every couple of days it needs, it needs updating. Um, and so I think that the analysis strategies that currently people are using kind of fall within this... Um, sort of framework where usually what people will do is they'll start with the raw data where, you know, there's expression of a lot of proteins um, or, or mRNA in a tissue. And then people do some low-level analysis. And this is uh, often very methodology-specific, right? So this is correcting for noise and background and batch correction and image co-registration and, and, and all of the things that really stem from using the technology. And kind of... Uh, uh, so that diverges between the different technologies, and I think the rest of the pipeline kind of converges between all of these different technologies, where people, the next stage is usually segmentation. People segment the cells out of the tissue. They then assign some kind of a phenotype to the cells. So uh, most, of, most, most often they will use algorithms that were not developed specifically for, spa for spatial imaging techniques. Sorry? Um, so there is a clustering stage. Is this point? No, there's a cluster. Oh. There's a. The other way. Uh, other way? No? C can you put the slide back on? Oh, oh. So there's some kind of a clustering stage. Then, you know, the uh, phenotypes of the cells are overlaid on the image. And then I think that's where the, uh, it diverges again. And then according to people's, you know, interests and questions, somebody will do all kinds of spatial analysis, multi identification of multicellular structures, uh, things that have to do with patient stratification or sample stratification. This is, again, a very divergent part between the different uh, labs and technologies. And I'll... Pass it on to GC to say a couple of words. Yeah, so uh, the, um, 
uh, Leah and uh, uh, myself, uh, uh, she's, uh, uh, there's a little bit difference. Uh, sh her main work is focused on the uh, proteomic side, and uh, my work is primarily focusing on the um, uh, transatomic side. So on the higher level, there's a lot of uh, similarities, uh, the question that uh, Leah had already mentioned. Uh, some of these uh, kind of uh, unique uh, uh, properties in the, uh, okay, for uh, just to illustrate some of the um, unique, uh, where's the test? Anyway, so uh, there should be some text over there, but uh, uh, this is fine too. Uh, uh, for the um, uh, RNA uh, Im imaging-based analysis, uh, primarily focusing on the uh, fish te kind of technologies, you have a number of the issues which uh, you know you can see clearly on the left hand side, which obviously you know you don't. Uh, so uh, some of the if you is there any way to dim the light a little bit? Uh, that'll be easier to see. Uh, can you dim the light a little bit? Yeah, anyway, so uh, there. So for the RNA-related issues, so you have uh, uh, typically what you do is that you do several rounds of these uh, hybridizations. So then, of course, there's a problem of uh, uh, how do you. Uh, combine the, the signals you go from uh, several rounds and then uh, 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 it's kind of like a barcode. Wait. Wait. Hmm? No. Is this here? Oh. Oh. Here and here. Yeah? Mark. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So, that. and uh, where's the pointer? Here and here. The pointer then? Here. The, the right. right. All right. Yes. Thank you. All right. Oh, but still, okay. Oh. Uh, not exactly right still. Uh, but anyway, so um, the, um, you have this uh, several rounds of the barcodes, and then typically what you do is that, oops, you uh, combine this uh, signal so from this uh, multiple rounds of uh, hybridization, you um, reconstruct this code, uh, and uh, the other issue you may have is that uh, you um, combine all this together. You, uh, I mean, for the RNAs, uh, actually quantification is actually quite easy. Once you debarcode this thing, then what you do is that uh, you just, uh, the signal becomes digital. You just need to count it kind of the dots. But still you have the problem like, uh, you know, um, uh, it's too dark to see for here, but you have this uh, kind of the staining, which could be like a DAPI or NISO or some other markers that cell, uh, delineate the cell boundaries. Uh, you uh, somehow, you can uh, delineate this, uh, 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 the, uh, the shapes and so on. Uh, the segmentation, sorry, that's what I mean. Uh, so, and in the, that's, a, we are gonna talk more about this uh, detailed, uh, uh, you know, questions later. But uh, I just wanna add that, um, uh, we, uh, there's also high level analysis, which uh, Leah, uh, Leah t mentioned in the beginning, uh, that uh, you know, how do you go from this raw data and uh, come up with this uh, uh, high level annotations that, and so on. So uh, the, uh, we, um, uh, our lab developed a tool called the Jotto, which is a pipeline trying to mitigate some of the lineages, but uh, uh, this is just the beginning. Obviously, we want to work with this uh, community uh, to develop, uh, to refine the tools and so on. Sorry, so, sorry, it took so much time. <laughs> uh, so, okay. I don't know why this is the worst. It only shows so weird. Okay, so I think this is a, a good time to start the discussion. And I th I, uh, we thought that it would be good to start, you know, with um, generating this community because it, it really still doesn't exist. Um, and so maybe if people around the room could introduce themselves, say who they are, what are they working on, what are they interested in in, um, um, in, in the realm of spatial imaging, what do you expect to learn, what, what, would, you, what would you find useful yeah. um, in some kind of these uh, spatial mm -hmm. imaging approaches. So do we have a brave volunteer to start? Mm -hmm. How many Anyone? of you have already worked on the spatial related uh, data analysis or production already? 
Uh, awesome. Uh, yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Neil raised his hand, so we're going to... So now <laughs> a little bit. Uh, you got to... Uh, Nir Yosef from UC Berkeley. Um, so I guess we've been working the past couple of years on developing methods uh, for single cell uh, RNA seq for a long time. And like many others and people in this room, we are very curious about the spatial uh, front as well. Uh, our point of view in looking at the data, especially in the last uh, uh, two years or so, is to take a probabilistic approach, try to build generative models uh, to reason on this data, and we kind of think about how we can do similar things w uh, with spatial data, and that's kind of the point of interest. Cool. Okay, awesome. Fabian? Yeah. Hi, Fabian Theis, um, Helmut Munich. Been interested, actually I, I came into the whole single cell field like ages ago because I've been working on time-lapse microscopy before, so that's why we always had some, some sort of spatial analysis question initially. And we've been dropping this, this a bit, but I, I think there's some really interesting question in terms of, maybe related to what Nir does, um, modeling, Initially, for us, very often something like shapes only, you know, just if you have a microscope, you, know, you can maybe do some arguing actually on, on, on thermoformetries. But I'm really excited about those more complex tissue structures that, for example, was one of your downstream questions, how to integrate that with the spatial, sort of, mm -hmm. uh, with those decoupled profiles. I think there's a lot of fun computation questions to be asked. I'm really looking forward to the community. I'm not sure about the name. You call it spatial imaging. Isn't it like double? Oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> what? There's a con <laughs> away? No, I, I to, uh, we discussed right? What's a good, good name? <laughs> yeah, we didn't come up with a name. Yeah. We are a scientist. I, I think the name. community building aspect is really worth it. I'm looking forward to that. Spatial TX sounds cool, so I'm not sure. Yeah, but then it's transcriptomics. And then people have on the spatial omics. Yeah. Hello, my name is Zina Perova, and um, I am uh, a member of the Human Cell Atlas data coordination platform. So we are very much interested in getting spatial data into the system as well. And this is one of the reasons why, why, why myself and other members are here today. Hi, um, I'm Gabby Yordinova, and I'm also a member of the data coordination platform. Um, and I'm a user researcher, so I'm trying to learn from all of you guys. <laughs> I'm Jim Saluka. I'm actually from HubMap. Uh, I'm a computational modeler and microscopist, and I'm interested in how we can standardize formats so that mm -hmm. we don't spend all of our time reformatting data, image data. <laughs> it's a good, good That's aim, very good aim. Jason Hilton uh, from Stanford, also um, part of the DCP. So uh, like my colleague said, we're here. Uh, we know it's going to come to the DCP, so we're wanting to keep our finger on the pulse of the community to see um, how we can help standardize, whether it's the format or the analysis, and uh, also just figure out the use cases so we make sure that we meet the user needs. Do you want to talk? Do you want to? No? <laughs> I saw some people in the, the back side? before that said they had some experience. The other side, I haven't uh -huh. talked yet. Hey, I'm uh, Doug Shepard. I'm at Arizona State University. Uh, we sort of develop new microscopy methods and work on then inferring spatial gene regulation. So a lot of the work has been done in vitro so far, say, actually extracting dynamic rate quantities from snapshot measurements. So you have fixed cells. How can you actually figure out the translation or the transcription to translation rates? Uh, and then we also work on spatial transcriptomics and light sheet imaging and things like that. Anybody else around here? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Andrea Radke at the National Institutes of, Institutes of Health uh, with Ron Germain, and we do a lot of confocal microscopy and high dimensional imaging and analysis. And we have a platform that we use that is devoid of segmentation to get away from some of the artifacts, mm -hmm. so it's pixel based, but I'm excited to be here. Um, I am Alvaro Martinez Barrio, and I come from the next genomics. So I've been working on the new Visium and, you know, the three different improvements that we have been doing in the Vision platform respect to the all special transcriptome. So I'm really keen on listening what you have here in this community. Anybody else? No? Okay. Um, does anybody want to, uh, yeah, go ahead. 
Hi, I'm Geraldine. I'm a postdoc from the Broad Institute. Uh, although I haven't worked on the spatial transcriptomics so of Wisconsin, but I think it's quite interesting. I want to uh, use this to address some questions such as the cell cell interruptions. So that's why I'm here. Awesome. Anybody else? Yeah. So I'm Matt Green. I'm, I'm also at the European Bioinformatics Institute. I was with the DCP for a while uh, where we wrote some metadata because we, we were trying to sort of standardize what people are going to be actually giving to the DCP to, to gather good quality metadata. But now I'm working on a tertiary portal at the other end, the one that was demonstrated first this morning. Um, they want to now include spatial imaging um, alongside um, um, sequencing data, um, both Visium based and, and, and also these um, fish sort of methods. So I'm really interested, I want to second the formats problem. So we want to put something nice on the front end that serves this community. Um, so some way to browse these data sets. Um, so I really want to know <clears throat> what these data sets have got in common um, and what very, very simple formats are going to get out, we're going to get, get out the other end. So right now we have cell by gene matrices, all the time for scene sequencing. Everyone plots Tisney plots. I want to know what these sort of common elements are that in, in this space that we need to be putting on our front end that you know, will be useful to everyone, basically. Yeah, so I think, I think we'll be talking about formats in a little bit, but it, I think it's a very good, good thing to be discussing. Okay, anybody else? No? Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, good that it uh, um, looks like uh, we are here or um, uh, come to the similar goals, right? So if you ask about uh, how to build uh, more fancy uh, microscopes and so on, uh, that's not uh, you know, what we are here for. So uh, the goal of this session is exactly trying to address these issues. So how do you uh, start it from data? And uh, maybe you can put up something over here. Yeah, yeah. so uh, some of the issues uh, um, involved in the uh, analysis and uh, in the end, uh, uh, in the, about uh, uh, visualization, sharing, and um, uh, how to um, uh, look forward and do the uh, proper you know, experiment design. So uh, I think uh, we are gonna, uh, the way we wanna do is that uh, maybe uh, go to each of the points uh, like uh, in depth and then get enough feedback so that we have enough uh, knowledge, uh, you know, who's doing what and uh, then maybe boost a way to build up some collaborations and so on. Yeah, so these, these are the points that we thought about, talking about some of the <coughs> low-level analysis that people are doing, then going uh, into the higher level, which is more shared across technologies. Uh, how do you interact with this kind of data and how do people would like to see themselves interacting with it? How do we share it between um, our community and how do we store it because it's heavy? Um, and then, you know, how can we guide the experiments, you know, thinking, uh, about about the data analysis um, to come. So this is kind of the talking points, and feel free, you know, if you have anything more or anything. Okay, so low-level analysis. Um, so you know, pre-processing, um, and we'd be ha very curious to hear from you um, things that you've kind of tackled in pre-processing, and if you found any kind of uh, creative solutions. Um, to, 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 the, to the things that you've been doing and just share a little bit um, from your experience, if anybody would like to kind of start the ball rolling on that. Um, I think the biggest thing is uh, background autofluorescence because we use, uh, we're using fluorescently conjugated antibodies and so depending on the tissue type, you'll get different kinds of autofluorescence autofluorescent signals. So one of the things that we do is just simple channel arithmetics, but then where that tops off where we capture an autofluorescent channel and then subtract it from the true signal minus the autofluorescent channel. But one of the things that tops off when you have these really large data sets, sometimes they can be 50 gigabytes or bigger, then you know, our, our, we just struggle for computational power. So that's one of the things. So background autofluorescence and then computational power to scale it for large, large volumes. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll comment and I'll say that from the mass-based approaches, we kind of have a similar thing. We don't have autofluorescence, uh, but we do have some metal background sometimes. Um, and, and we've kind of, I think, converged on, on similar approaches. Is anybody else? Yeah. So I think 
I mean, autofluorescence is something we think about a lot too. For some of the spatial transcriptomic methods, particularly single molecule localization based, it's a pure subtracting the signal I think can be quite problematic because you're already at the sort of noise level of the detector. And so we use a lot of likelihood based methods to sort of ask whether or not the data, we think it was real or not, so we actually assign a probability whether or not a set of pixels actually was the spot we think it is. And so that all comes from the super resolution community, but there's not a good robust sort of way to handle that at the moment, I'd say. And so um, I'm kind of hoping eventually there's a chemistry solution to the autofluorescence, but if there is a more intelligent sort of deconvolution based way of doing it for these low signal to noise situations, we'd be really happy to try it. Anybody else want to talk about some, uh, some low-level analysis stuff? GC, do you want to maybe click and we'll see some of the points that we, that we thought about um, uh, addressing? First, uh, remote, okay, right there. Um, yeah, Fabi. I, I can just extend like from the normal bright field things we have had, in particular if you want to stitch together multiple slices, so if you have bigger data sets that you have to do some sort of uneven lighting connection and co correction and those sort of very basic steps. And in fact, we have a te technique called basics to do so, and it seems to be working out <laughs> rather robustly, but there's many of, of those, these things around, and I wonder how important that is for different uh, omics approaches as well, that if you have some sort of spatial inhomogeneity that's somewhat consistent, that if you not put things together, that you should overall correct all these things. Yeah. I think that this particular question is out of scope for this group. Uh, the only people that can decide how to properly pre-process a fluorescent image is a fluorescent microscopist. And the only person that can figure out how to properly process a mass spec image is mass spec people. I think what this group should be concerned with is when they're done processing it, the data looks the same. It doesn't matter if it's a fluorescent three channel color image or if it's a 20,000 channel single cell uh, RNA seq data set. The data should look the same. And then downstream, how do you annotate the data so that your annotations look the same? So I, I, if you get into the nuts and bolts of each technology, you're, you're never going to get anything done. And your interface ultimately has to make them all look exactly the same anyway. So you probably should focus on making them all look the same and let the individual technology communities come up with their own best practices. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll just comment on that and I'll say that I think that methods could be transferred um, across some of these different co technologies and you know it's, there's, there's things that are inherent to the fact that you're measuring a lot of channels. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you're using cyclic antibodies or cyclic oligos um, and, and, and people can can learn from each other uh, in, yeah. in that respect. But if, if people are, are more interested in moving forward to the higher analysis yeah. uh, stuff, we could definitely do that too. Yeah, I just want to uh, maybe add uh, to, uh, to that a little bit is that uh, uh, since we are a big uh, community and a lot of different technologies that are being used here. So uh, as um, uh, I, I agree with you, like, uh, you know, the uh, technical experts, they know their data the best, perhaps. But then uh, they usually they don't care that much about how to integrate data with other you know technologies and so on. So I thought that uh, you know in order to reach the point that uh, we can share the data and the format and processing everything in a comparable way, then I think it would be good for the you know uh, bring up all the uh, you know people with diverse uh, background to say you know are there anything we c in common you know we can extract and done that in a more or less. Uh, comparable way and uh, smooth fashion, I think. We've been working on this for <clears throat> about a year and we're probably a decade behind uh, GoodMap and trying to do the same thing. So there's mm -hmm. been groups doing this for a long time and we still don't have a solution. Uh, but if you start getting the technology weeds, you're going to get the problem of next year there's going to be a new technology. So what you need right now is an agreement of something along the lines, it's OME TIP. You have to export OME tip. End of story if you're coming up from a cell. If you're coming down from the whole organ, it must be an OBJ file. Otherwise, you're going to get 57 flavors of TIFF and PNGs and GIFs and bitmaps and JPEGs and MPEGs, and no one's going to be able to make anything out of it. The challenge right now is to pick 
one or two formats and then figure out how you're going to associate annotations in a robust way. Because as far as I know, there aren't any image formats that robustly are annotatable. Uh, so if you could solve those two problems, you know, pick one or two image file formats and figure out a way to annotate, I think you're way ahead of the game. And worrying about how you're going to pre-process an image, I, I don't think that's going to be a useful use of your time. I, I would like to pose a question to the crowd. Oh, here we go. I would just emphasize that that's a very important question, file format, yeah. And so right now we share our as OME TIFF, so definitely that's, but those are really kind of big and cumbersome too. So finding a way, you know, uh, what is it, compressionless loss, like finding better ways to transfer the data well, without losing all the metadata is also very important. Um, I would like to pose the question of, do people think that data sharing should be done at the level of raw data after some kind of, you know, background noise, core registration, you know, some kind of pre-processing? I mean, at which, I think that's another big question for the community, at, at which levels do we actually share the data between, between members of the community? Coming from old school bioinformatics, what really revolutionized our ability to use uh, shared data sets is the container aspect, where you have the metadata all contained around an object, in this case would be a standard image format. So if you could build like a bioconductor for spatial imaging, that would be great, where you have all your metadata contained in a file that has the image embedded in it. Kind of, um, I don't think Affymetrix did that with the cell, I think they did it Maybe not the cell file, but the, um, one of the file types they had maybe had embedded data as well, but uh, on the microarray imaging. But if you could do that, that would be great. And that would go back towards like what type of data to share, because then if you had a standard format, it would be very easy to share among everyone, especially if the resolution was stored and the uh, provenance was stored. Image. Anyone else? What you, yeah. So for larger imaging, fluorescent imaging data sets, there is a sort of open source initiative called Big Stitcher in this HDF5 file format, and it's moving to N5. And so within that, you store a multi-resolution version of the image, and so, um, and it can be compressed. And so this is an effort kind of being let out of Max Planck Dresden. But I'd say that there's a big push to try and standardize things around that for these really, really large three-dimensional imaging data sets, because this container format can be moved, it can be compressed and it contains all the metadata in it, and so that's a really useful thing. So there's a Nature Methods paper that just came out recently on like that file format, and, and there's an open source program to actually convert data to it for 3D data. So for fluorescence data, and actually I think you could probably store, I mean you guys store your data as TIFFs too, and so you could convert it into that as well. So. Is that a flexible metadata format? You can, you can annotate however you want in it, yeah, so. What about labeling of specific objects? So it's not that? meant for that, right? So it's, it's just yeah. meant as a way to move the data around and have all the metadata that was contained with the experiment in it, but it's, it's really meant as a container for the data that you then do something with, so. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, fuck it. I, I, I think something we learned from Seeing as RNA seek, as well as I guess from maybe we could learn from the computer vision community, was that addressing all of those questions has turned out to be sort of, I think, efficient as, as soon as enough data, maybe from one or potentially multiple modalities, have been around so that people then actually start comparing. Like, you know, the compute people come up and they start comparing the methods, write some type of benchmark paper or something like that. And I think for some of these things, as was rightfully said, so of course for the actual fluorescent based things, these have been around for some time, but from others, maybe they still need to be done. But I guess so far, if, if there's no yet nice test bed or sandbox for playing around beyond maybe spatial TX or some of those repos, I think that might not be so quick advancing. But I think as soon as many of those around, you know, you could organize maybe a, a jamboree for benchmarking the best uh, batch correction method on, on, on spatial core registration. I'm not sure if you really won't go there, but potentially, and then maybe you get people together. Anybody else? So, um, okay, so if there are no um, other comments about this, uh, then um, I guess uh, the, 
next uh, question that uh, uh, we are asking maybe like um, related to what uh, being discussed before, right? So when you share the metadata and so on, what exactly, you know, uh, information do you want to keep in those files? What exactly is the biological information you want to keep? Obviously, uh, if you want to do this uh, uh, um, spatial transatomics, you want to know the reads, uh, the uh, um, localization, the uh, um, uh, which uh, cells these uh, uh, reads are assigned to. Um, and if you do this uh, proteomic, uh, I think uh, it's probably the similar thing. Uh, what about this uh, morphology, which is uh, kind of uh, unique to this uh, perspective? So uh, that's not, uh, uh, that's very, I think what's uh, different uh, than a lot of the genomics analysis. And so how do you preserve that? So that's not, uh, you know, I think anything else or, you know, or how do you, uh, your experience, uh, you know, tackling these things? Any, any, anything else you want to add to this list? <laughs> uh. Maybe you take that. I think in your, in your first slide, yeah. you had this, this workflow of different steps that you, that you guys suggested, right? And I think uh, what I saw, it was like you start with raw, raw data, low-level analysis, and then you said segment, cluster, and then you do overlay and sort of the higher-level things, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wanting to know, would you recommend basically always to do segmentation or isn't there, I know from, I think from, for example, from the 4i paper, I think they also did essentially just voxel-based analysis and then sort of clustered them because of their spatial profiles and then found something that's organelle specific. So is, is the segmentation, yeah. which we know, you know, could be problematic and so, yeah. sort of mostly recommended and maybe then also just, you know, this could be something that's much easier to share because then you have your back to cells or do you maybe mm -hmm. also want to do something with the uh, so maybe Leah to can add uh, later. So I mean, our um, uh, view is a little bit biased because uh, we have been working on this uh, single cell resolution uh, data all along. So in that case, uh, then uh, I think uh, it's uh, uh, if you don't do the segmentation, you lose a lot of information, right? So we definitely want to keep that information. But uh, I think but then, then you uh, aggregate over over pixels sort of in a cell and then count basically how many counts you have and then just work on the downstream graph or you still work on the images? Uh, in our case, we don't uh, because mm. uh, that's uh, to us is a less biological interpretable, right? Yeah. Because uh, the cells obviously is a more relevant, uh, you know, unit. Sure. But uh, if you have uh, uh, like uh, uh, technologies that are not uh, single cell resolved, then what's the fundamental unit of that? Uh, I mean, uh, you true. probably, you know, you cannot do, realistically do some segmentation even, but that's just uh, my personal bias. Maybe any other you have. Uh, so, um, I wanted to pick up on that. I forget where it was. Some meeting I saw a talk that even when you have cellular resolution data, you want to do regional uh, analysis in some case and ignore cell segmentation to identify say layers of the cortex and so they said that there's some if you do it based on cellular segmentation you don't see the layers as cleanly uh, but if you if you do it just based on regions you start to see markers that are shared between cells in the same layer even though they're cells of different subtypes and so then the layers come into focus mm -hmm. much better but I mean, that was just second-hand information. I, mean, I don't know if you have experience with something like that. So uh, in our experience, uh, I think uh, uh, the, we can still see this uh, spatial, the layered information. Uh, we published a paper last year. We showed that, that you, know, you can still maintain this uh, uh, layered information by after the cell segmentation. That's not potential here. Uh, in our experience, uh, what uh, could uh, lead to problem is that uh, uh, if you uh, analyze the data, uh, like uh, tr uh, throw away the spatial information in the very beginning, right? So uh, then uh, sometimes you kind of uh, uh, throw away the markers that are really relevant uh, to this uh, layer structures that you're talking about. So that's, to me, that's a kind of like uh, a uh, analysis kind of pipeline. I mean, like that's something that uh, you, uh, you can do, deal with, you recognize that problem, you can deal with that problem analytically, but the, everything can be done after you segment the cells. 
Thank you. It's just a mic. Um, yeah, I've got a microphone. So I was going to say, back in the day, we used to do segmentation because we certainly appreciate you want to convert your pixels to cells and people like quantifying in that. And it certainly has strengths. Uh, and you can segment pretty readily and easily. But then with certain cell populations, it gets tricky, like dendritic cells or stromal cells or mm -hmm. even acellular networks, you know, like a collagen or extracellular matrix. And so when you do a pixel-based approach, you, you know, divorce yourself from any kind of segmentation artifacts. But again, then you struggle to not actually have the quantifying cells, but you can quantify pixels. So while we've worked and invested in this would be something that would be really great and an objective, I think, for the HCA is to, you know, train, like do some deep learning approaches to train on the different cell subsets where you get, you know, one of our limiting factors is we don't have enough cells or we need ground truth for some of those interesting stromal networks. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, an unmet need that would help on so many different, you know, would be independent of platform uh, is to really train on those unique subsets and mm -hmm. be able to automate that, that, that process. So I, I want to follow up on that too, and I, I completely agree. And, and regarding your question, Fabian, I think there is merit in both levels. Yeah. So for some things, you really want to work on a pixel or a voxel space. Um, on the other hand, if you really want to communicate with a biology yeah. community, the entity is a cell. And, and I would actually even go back to the image that we had up there in the beginning. I mean, the way we think about biology is about cells interacting with each other. Um, and, you know, even if a dendrite is very long and, you know, like this process is doing something, we're, we are still thinking about it as part of this dendrite. And so I really think that you do need both views. And I actually think that these multiplexed approaches kind of give us a unique opportunity to really start obtaining both of them. Because I think that unlike the, you know, like the three color fluorescence, now you have enough markers to be able to delineate really the shapes of cells. Right? So, you know, if you have, for example, if you devote 15, 10, 20 markers of your panel into really identifying the shapes of the cells, then you can actually start integrating these voxel-based approaches and the segmentation and, and, you know, increasing the reliability of your segmentation. So, I mean, I, I still feel that labs are kind of moving between these two spaces, and it's, it currently depends on your question, but also that these multiplexed approaches are going to drive us more towards, you know, doing segmentation the right way. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had a question about the segmentation in tissue for people who work on it. So this is a difficult problem. Oh, sorry, are you? Okay. No, no, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, you have these very densely packed cells and you have, maybe you devote some portion of your panel to maybe things that you think should be membrane bound and then you have a resolution which is finite and so you end up having trouble segmenting right and so there's different strategies people have taken i'd say with transcriptomic it's even harder because we have a point cloud and we're attempting to then potentially segment out of that point cloud around a nucleus and so i think the two problems are slightly different but for the proteomics based ones what is the current strategy to sort of have robust segmentation versus kind of segmentation does anybody want to? Anyone yeah. else want to add in that? Okay. Uh, a lot of the multi omics groups have, have come to the conclusion that what you need, what you, you always have to have more than one image, and often something like an H and E registration image. You're going to collect an H and E image, and then you're going to do your multi omics underneath that. Uh, that couples it back. H and E couples it back to about you know 100 years of histology. And the histologist can look at that image and outline every single cell on there and tell you what, what exactly whatever what all those cells are. So we need some way to be able to capture multiple versions of the same image. So the, the problem that, so I agree, pathologists have more experience than all of us do on this. Um, the problem is if we're talking about taking huge amounts of data for a cell atlas, we need a robust computer vision methodology to go about doing this. Yeah, and, and so that's, called, that's called an H&E. Or, no, uh, no, I mean that, def that or but I mean that doesn't work for all of these cell types, right? And so, like robustly quantifying out of this data and then correlating that to, let's say, ion, you know, mass ion imaging. Um, I mean, I think if you practically look at the data, it's pretty clear that's a really difficult problem that's unsolved. Like, and the, and they do do H and E, say, in the Angelo lab, and and it's definitely not the end all be all to get the segmentation. 
So, so I think it, the reason I pose it, it's an open question, so I was just curious. So, so I agree, including more information in prior knowledge is important, but how do you translate that prior knowledge into a computer vision that is gonna robustly go about the problem, I think is an unsolved issue that we need to think about a lot. So I, I can comment a little bit about uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is really using H&Es on serial sections. The problem is that it's not a one-to-one -one registration, right? I mean, the cells that you have on the H&E are not exactly the cells that you have on whatever you're doing your multiplexed imaging on. It's, it's by definition a different section. Um, and so one of the things that we've started applying is these new transfer learning approaches. Um, it's, you know, it's starting to work, but it's not there. Um, and one thing that we've found super useful is to engage the pathologist community and just generate a huge mess of ton of um, manually segmented data to train deep learning on it. And, and that has proven to be incredibly efficient. And I think that if we're talking about efforts that could be coordinated around this community and a joint repository, I actually think that this is one of the best things that we can kind of coordinate as a community, which is, you know, pathologists, they, they do that all the time. And, you know, they have a lot of pathology residents that need something to do for their summer rotation. And, and um, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. But, but, um, but, but I, I actually think that would be a very useful tool for this community. So yeah. for the sake of time, maybe we'll just take one more question and move on. Oh. I would just second the importance, especially for the utility of the Atlas, is to bring in the pathologists and, you know, not because they're doing low plex, but in, embrace them because they are so helpful and uh, really knowledgeable, and then they would get the buy-in. So I definitely don't want to overlook that as well. I just want to say that's a very important point. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, I think if there are no other burning questions, maybe we should move on because we still have several topics we need to discuss. And uh, this is actually uh, uh, a uh, kind of a, uh, very needed area because uh, whenever you have the data, you want to you know uh, uh, look at that, interact with the data, and uh, then uh, it's n generating this annotation is one thing, but how do you uh, you know look at them and uh, you know make sense of that is another one. So uh, are there any like um, uh, challenges, uh, you know, approaches that you would like to see, or you know um, anyone want to jump in to discuss? This uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, is more relevant uh, for people who um, uh, um, you know want to develop some new you know hypothesis out of these uh, out of this uh, you know the data and uh, you know it's uh, oftentimes it's not uh, uh, it cannot be phrased in a very you know quantitative way. For example, one thing that uh, we found that that's particular interesting in visualization is that. Uh, when you uh, overlay the information uh, between the transcriptomic information and the cell morphology information, and you can start to make some sort of uh, you know hypothesis about uh, you know what's the relationship between these two and so on. But uh, you know if you don't uh, you know see that in the beginning, I mean you um, you can build some uh, you know machine learning tools and whatever, but it's a kind of like a shooting in the dark. It's really like uh, looking at them side by side especially what's the spatial information. We, we have some you know, comments about that. You know. uh, what's the missing by uh, using just the uh, clustering, you know, um, finding the cell types? Uh, maybe there are some genes that have very, very clear spatial information. And uh, then you know, somehow it's, uh, you, know, you don't see that in, the, you, know, in your um, uh, uh, you know, clustering and whatever analysis. So then you may wonder, you know, what's going on there, right? Um, any comments? I mean, what? Is, I mean, there's two things. One, you want what do you want to see, and the other thing is that what kind of the challenges that uh, you uh, you're facing. Yeah. So I'll just I just want to frame it from 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 a perspective that I keep hearing. So. I, I, I used to be a microscopist, I used to work in the lab, so in, in my current role, I'm working with a lot of people in the DCP who do sequencing, they're from the sequencing world. And they constantly try and draw um, similarities between imaging and sequencing all the time. Yeah. But That's right. what, I all, what I'm always trying to say to them is that, that the imaging, where we are with imaging, we're, we're actually a few steps further back. And 
one of those things that I think is important is the fact that we don't have these robust ways of sharing data. That, that's both, we don't have the, the archiving infrastructure that's well established, we don't have the formats that are well established, so it's quite difficult for, for analysis groups like this to, sh to share data. So, and it, we're making slight steps towards that. So, it, I, I mean, I might be, my, might be naive because I don't know about other bioimage archives out there, but I know that in the EBI, they've just built a bioimage archive that's for raw data. Um, and then there's IDR, which is, a, which is sort of like slightly better annotated and, and nice viewers on top of that. But I've been looking at the metadata standards there and it's very sort of, um, well, because imaging can do so much, it's very up in the air about, you know, it's very sort of, um, it's not very well defined, right? We don't have, you know, the three sequencing machines. We've got thousands of different microscopes and we've got different formats. And so everything's so up in the air, you know, I'm really um, sort of always trying to think what can we do? What is, this, is the similarities that we can come, come to? Because when we start using these bioimaging archives, when, you know, we solve these scaling problems in the cloud and all these sorts of things, um, it'd be good if we at least start to converge around some sort of format. And, and I don't know if, if anyone here knows where that discussion is happening and where, you know, you can, we can go and start to have that discussion as a community even. Um, and, you know. What the database is called? What was the biggest one, maybe? So, so the bioimage bio -image archive. Um, is, is, is sort of a new, is a new archive and, and that hosts sort of um, a lot of um, um, a lot of protein um, um, what's it called um, a lot of protein images yeah immunohistochem immune exactly yeah then I, IDR's got like some quite nice viewing um, platform on top of that so you can sort of like look through 3D images and they're all annotated you can draw on that it does a load of things yeah so so that's what I know that's out there um, but yeah but but, but when, it, when you look into the metadata, it is, it is a bit of a mess. And so, so in the DCP, we're working, we're working closely with Space TX. And so the discussion there was essentially, so Space TX has gathered all these tools together. They're doing some benchmarking there. They're just trying to gather everything together and, and really come up with pipelines, work, work with different teams. Um, and they, they've come up with um, a format that they're, they're starting to define. Now, I hear from different labs that, that are pro or against it or like it or don't because, of, because this community is just not used to having to, you to standardize, right? You're used to solving a problem in your lab, publishing your paper, and then, you know, whereas, you know, in other communities, it's, a, it's more strict. A lot of this work's already been done. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, so people are sort of, you know, a bit wary of these standard formats. But, but the SpaceDX format, there's, there's certain metadata that's piled in up to the point of what's relevant for analysis. So what for, for stitching, for doing the primary analysis that you were talking about there, the secondary analysis maybe. But then all the biological metadata on top of that that's stacked on, like, you know, if the donor was smoking or not or what, you know, these sorts of things, these problems are solved from the other direction. So, mm -hmm. um, so top-down metadata um, standards are, are there. But connecting those top-down sort of sample metadata standards to something that's, you know, these lower level metadata that's about what the images are. So that, that's really what, the, what in the DCP, me and Zena have been trying to work out how to do. So uh, if anyone's got any ideas about either where the discussion's happening or what we need to include or, you know, anything that's in common, then um, I'd like to know what people's thoughts on, on that. Yeah. So related to that, how many of these uh, imaging uh, data generating group are interacting with the DCP right now? So there's, there's the Space TX group consortium, which is um, a ton of labs. Is, how many labs is there? Ten? Ten, yeah. So, so ten groups there. Uh -huh. Then the Sanger Institute have got a, a large initiative that, that they're interacting with the DCP. They want to put, give us data. Uh -huh. um, there's really not many protein groups at the minute interacting, but the metadata standards that we've, we've come up with, are, I mean, this is just target, right? Target-based, you know? If you target a protein or not, or a piece of DNA, it doesn't matter, really. So, um, so the metadata standard there is flexible, so we're really waiting for someone to come to us with this. Um, but the mi at the minute, another big difference between the sequencing side and the imaging side is that in sequencing, all the strategies from a few different platforms is, okay, let's build a pipe pipeline that's robust, then we, um, and we benchmark it, and then labs send us their raw data straight off the back of the machine, the imager, um, the sequencer, and then we analyze it, and then we can compare it, and we've done one pipeline. Now, they, in, this, in our world, that's just not going to happen, right, for a long time. I, I, I can't see, you know, because like, like we've we identified before, that in the lab, you're, you're close to the data, you're the best people for analysis. So I'm, I personally am happy to ignore all this 
faff that's going on in the lab <laughs> to get this beautiful data. But the, where we can start maybe is right at the top end, you know, in terms of sharing um, when it's all processed, you know. Um, maybe, but I don't know. So I'll, I'll go back to the question that I posed before in terms of sharing. So, you know, there's, there's all this low-level processing that we discussed where you, you know, end up getting to a nice image, which we would all envision comes out of the machine, but it really doesn't come out of the machine that way. So, you know, there's, there's the point of getting to beautiful images, right? And that's, I think, one level of, of data sharing that should be on these kinds of portals and, and people are interacting with. But I think the second level is, you know, after you've done some annotation on the images, and this is not an image annotation, this is an object within the image annotation, right? So, you know, not everybody wants to do segmentation or voxel segmentation or any kinds of object identification within the image. And so, you know, once people have done that, that I think is like a second layer in which people would now like to share the data and be able to interact with it. So now let's say, okay, if I want to test my uh, microenvironmental algorithm or my cellular neighborhoods algorithm, I don't want to go into the segmentation of all these different data sets that people have created, right? I just want to test, you know, at that kind of level. And so I think that's, let's say, another format where it would be useful for people to, to share their data and have the community interact with it. So I think, I think in our case, you know, unlike with the sequencing, there are maybe a few steps along the, the processing pipeline where people would like to be able to share and receive data. And if anybody wants to comment about that. I just want to completely agree. I think it's uh, really important. And it's also particularly important to empower the community to make um, people be able to sort of access, use, and develop on this data um, quickly. One of the things that we realize is that there's a huge entry barrier because all this low level algorithms, even to the level of segmentation and object recognition are, are hard and they are limiting the entrance of people who could contribute to the higher level interpretive algorithms that are sorely needed and still very poor and basic. And so this would be an incredibly empowering thing. The limit is not the getting that done. The limit now, I think, is that there's no way to share that once someone has done it. Yes, there's right. no standard way. If I segment an image, there is no standard way for me to share that with anyone else. That's very true. Actually, earlier on, there was a, a discussion at the developmental, um, I'll, um, bring it, developmental Atlas uh, group. Someone just asked exactly the same question. They got uh, like uh, tons and tons of data. They don't know what to share, and they cost them uh, a lot, a lot of money just to maintain the data themselves. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's something that uh, the DCP or you know whoever, in uh, you know, uh, maybe take uh, a little bit of uh, help, you know, to how how if they have already done that. So. Um Talking about sharing, then I want to pose a question maybe slightly different way. If everyone who works with the data, who produces the data, could think about would we rather establish a standard format and make everyone go towards it, something that has been done in astronomy, for example, or there, ha or there is no solution like that and there has to be certain, as per level, certain kind of agreement of the tools that can be created to work around sharing in multiple formats. And I mean, Omitif has been mentioned as one that community uses quite a lot, but if, if everyone has to think by themse for themselves, what, what would I prefer for using, for, for giving my data to, or for using someone else's data? What, what's, what is your personal question, or oh, personal answer to, like, to this question? If anyone has it or is happy to share. Does anybody want to comment or maybe share from their experience what have they been using so far? Yeah. Or what has worked? Or what has worked? Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Sergio Gomez. I am working for a company here in Spain. And uh, we are uh, mostly working in hospitals. Oh. So in hospitals, you have cardiologists, neurologists, pathologists, and they uh, use mostly the DICOM standard, right? 
to share information among them. So uh, we will initiate a, a, a human, uh, no, sorry, an Horizon 2020 project next January, and we will we would like to explore the potential of uh, the DICON standard, which is an international standard uh, for medical imaging, also uh, in the human cell atlas. Obviously, we, we will have to do uh, research about the, the use of this standard, but it's now being used by, by the pathologists in, 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 in different uh, labs, also to share information among them. So I don't know if you have already evaluated the possibility to, to use this standard because also it allows the inclusion of um, clinical data about the patient in the, in the hidden. So. so DICOM is, is the image format that comes out of uh, commercial imaging, medical imaging machinery. And so, so DICOM and OBJ files and all that kind of stuff come out of there. As far as I know, you can include metadata, but you can't draw a circle and say this is dead tissue and, and embed that information in the file. So when the image goes away, it goes to somebody else, they can open it up and say, yes, indeed, this is annotated as having dead tissue in it. And oh, by the way, the person didn't get to make up dead tissue. It's, you know, foundational model of anatomy number 47261 in a, you know, in, in a formalized way. So that it's a region and a formalized annotation on it. I don't think DICOM will let you do that. But OME TIFF won't let you do that, and OBJ won't let you do that. And right now, as far as I know, nothing will let you do that. So we have no way right now of sharing an annotated image. So I, I can comment about uh, what we've been doing in, in our lab, which I don't think is the, definitely the right way to do it, but maybe it's a start of a way to do it. So we've been really sharing data between ourselves at several levels. So, you know, there is like one uh, multi-level image, um, which, which is the raw data. And then we use uh, basically um, object matrices to save, or labeled matrices, to save annotations at different levels. Um, but that really has been kind of customary to the question, right? So, you know, we always have one such labeled matrix, which is at the cell level on which we annotate B cells, T cells, cancer cells, et cetera. Um, and then some projects will have such additional matrices in which they annotate these multicellular structures. So, you know, necrosis and dead tissue and tumor immune border. And, and these annotations either, comes, either come from algorithms, you know, where people, you know, clustered cellular neighborhoods and, and found these annotations and, and generated this labeled matrix or um, from people circling stuff, you know, from a pathologist sitting and circling, and, and it doesn't really matter what it comes from. Uh, but we've been saving sort of these matrices, and then they come with, you know, some kind of an additional um, explanation of what are these labeled. And, and so this, this has been a start for us, but uh, it's definitely not standardized uh, at this moment to be shared across multiple, multiple groups which are annotating at different, different levels. And of course, when we go to subcellular, that's, an, that's another one. Can yeah. I ask just, what are the actual formats? So, so what's the raw data format that you're sharing and the... TIFFs. TIFFs, so, okay. Yeah, TIFFs, yeah. I, th I, th I, I think what would be interesting is, that, I mean, for the raw data, of course, there's... A, um, all kinds of things that you can maybe discuss for sharing, and I guess you can load across different formats and so on. But right before we in the discussion, we said there's also a subpart of analysis where we really just work on segmented images after all, and then you know annotate those. And that's sort of what's what's kind of peculiar about our community, right? When this other stuff has been done by pathologists for for a long time, and obviously there's a lot of interesting things to be done. But on uh, on the fact that per cell now we have so many counts and sort of have additional information that could maybe sort of give an additional multi-rate view to things as you also alluded before, it could be sp special. And for sharing this type of aggregated data, that should be much easier. I mean, then we can go back to more existing tools, right? I mean, you mentioned Loom file, right? Or we just go into Surat or, or, or end data type of thing, we just sort of had F additional spatial position. And that might be, I think, for quite a few downstream analysis also be enough already. So this might, should be at least the, the easier part. But for that, I was, I was wondering, if you segment, would you 
be happy with just sharing positions of, let's say, sales centers or something like that? Or would you be interested in you know, sales touching, maybe their boundaries, like all this additional stuff to share as well? Yeah, I, I think that I was going to hit that part. Like, what is the annotations that you would like to be transferred with the file, the physical file that you share, which is restricted and which are belonging more to a central repository, like Peter was saying yesterday about the cell annotator. And we should also difference in those levels. Uh, I would like some ideas about that. So... I actually, you know, I actually took that approach in, in, in the beginning when we started looking at this type of data, and we learned a few things. Uh, first, uh, there's currently no decent segmentation algorithms out there that we're happy with that will make me comfortable enough by chucking away an ability to see how good or bad the segmentation is and trusting the counts of whatever poor segmentation algorithm I decided to suffice with so I could move forward. Um, second, I learned that you know at the end of the day, if we don't care about all these other spatial entities, then why go through the headache and not just go genome-wide and go single-cell RNA-seq? We've actually found uh, the boundaries, the shape of the cell, the size of the sh cell, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the, the, you know, how round or not round it is, um, where uh, the, the molecules are in the cell in terms of their uh, distribution and location and, and orientation to be incredibly important information. And I think that if we have a very simple format that loses all that information, then what we have is something that's even dirtier than single-cell RNA-seq uh, with many, many less uh, markers. So I actually completely um, chucked that direction in the trash about a year and a half ago. But the, right now, we can't even do anything like just say the blue channel is my nuclear stain, right? That's a form of segmentation. It's annotated and it identifies a biological object. But right now, we don't even have a way of doing that in our own chip. Uh, there actually are ways to do that. So there are, there are, you can yeah. do that. As a standard way, well, then that's and exactly. And in the H, HD5 and the HD5 all allow you to do that. But that, then that's exactly how you would do all your RNA-seq data. It's, it's just a color channel. And you don't lose any data, and you don't have to do any segmentation on it. And segmentation is all downstream of it. But my understanding is actually OME TIFF does not have a robust way of annotating a color channel in terms of assigning a, 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 an ontological tag, for instance, to the color channel. So the problem is people don't adhere to the, microscope companies don't adhere to the format. So this is the problem. So, so we, we, this conversation, I, I, so a point got brought up earlier about should we standardize around a format or have a set of tools to bring it into what you can work with? The, the, I mean, so I come more from the microscope community. The, the big choices of packages like bioformats and things that explicitly attempt to just sort of take formats from other microscope vendors and do that. And you're never going to get the vendors to, to standardize. So people who build open source tools like we do, we might, there's a movement to use OMETIF, for instance. But no, Leica and Zeiss and Nikon and Olympus and all these companies are never going to get along, right? They're just not going to. They, they have historical reasons for why they did the way the things they did. So you can definitely do that in OMETIF. Also, I think there's a lot to be learned from the neuroscience community here. So they have open source annotation tools, which can be shared, where the data is stored in the cloud, and then you can have massive annotation by all sorts of users. So one is called CATMAID, C-A-T-M-A-I-D. It stands for some acronym. And then that actually, you know, they use this to segment their EM data, and they can have, it's very similar to like an annotation engine for single cell RNA-seq data, for instance. You can have different users, different consensuses. And so, there are a lot of tools in neuroscience that have already been developed to work on this kind of thing where they were inspired by what the pathology tools were. And so I think, you know, a, a careful survey and talking to the microscopy community who works on these things before reinventing the wheel I think is pretty necessary um, because a lot of this stuff is stuff that other groups are thinking about, not just the Cell Atlas group. Well, there's, there's a difference between someone has done something. In so so this is a robustly supported distributed platform yeah, that is well checked out and, you know, is developed as an sense to be deployed. To, we, we were talking so. to OME TIFF, to the TIFF uh, uh, bioformats group two weeks ago in Stanford. 
and they do not say they say they do not have a way to annotate color channels that's robust and that's that's the bioformats people so I think what we should be doing here is not saying what is possible or not possible with this particular tool, not participable particular tool, but define what we want, what we need, and what our priorities have. And if that's what we need, then we'll get some way to build these tools. We're not limited to the current available tools today, right now, here and now. Our goal is to define what do we want, what do we need, what do you know, what would, we, what would be ideal in our eyes, ignoring what exists, and then prioritize that, because we can't do it all at once overnight. Anybody else want to say about their, something about their experience and what have they been using so far and has worked for them, or what they found missing when they were using any kinds of these tools? What about visualization, so interacting with these um, multi multi-channel images, how do you actually look at 40 channels or 50 or 100 channels in an image together? Does anybody want to comment about that? Any favorite visualization tool? You want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I don't think there is, the, I mean, your brain isn't really capable, right? So you have to have some ability to swap between channels and false color, and you have to take into account there's a large significant of color blind. So, this big stitcher tool I mentioned works well. I think you guys have something you internally use where you can switch channels on and off. Um, this cat made tool I mentioned works pretty well. Neuroglancer is another option. Fiji itself is not great for this because you have to swap between channels. And so there's, you know, there's some stuff that exists, some stuff that doesn't. I think the problem is all of those are viewers. There's very few of them that combine a viewer plus a tool to be able to interact with the data. And, and store. So, and store. And so I think that's actually what's lacking a bit is the ability to say, okay, I looked at these four channels, I then want to annotate the cell and then store that annotation. If we're talking about tools that we could really use, again, I think some of the neuroscience tools are getting close, but that's the type of thing that like would be great to have. And so if you had to have to have a separate metadata file that then reads in what the color channels are because you're concerned about robustness, mm -hmm. then I think that's solvable, right? And someone just needs to write a metadata file. But that doesn't exist at the moment as far as I'm, so there are lab specific solutions of say we have one, but there's not, there's nothing that's meant for everything. And so I think that would be a really good place for people to concentrate on. So I can say that in our experience, one thing that we found very useful was kind of to flip between these two views of the data. One is the images and the other is a matrix like, like Fabian said, you know, which is more similar to what you get from the single cell data where you know at, at one time you can really see spatial distribution of proteins and see how the cell looks like in morphology but then connect it to just you know like a row in a matrix where you see all the expression of all the different genes and get you know like the clustering of these cells and so there are a couple of tools that kind of allow you to navigate between these two views of the data one is histocat that Baron presented uh, this morning there's another one uh, which is called Oh, it's named after some kind of a lizard. Mantis, Mantis, which was generated by Pisces. Um, and, and I think there are, uh, uh, there's Visio Farm. They are now kind of uh, developing their own tool for that. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of viewers that allow you to move between these two views of the data. Yeah, our that, Jota also does a yeah. little bit of that and as well. I, I, I was wondering what we do once we have maybe agreed on, on that format or before maybe you just do it for your own project. So there have been a few papers early on when those first methods came out, like I think spatial differential expression analysis or what mm -hmm. they have been, been called, and I think they have been only sort of scratching a little bit at the surface. So what would be real sort of common use cases what you would ask on top of this data? So you suggested for some you switch back and forth, right, between the two views, but what are you actually asking and what could be formulated potentially in a statistical model to be tested for? Is it like these shared patterns? Could that be sort of phrased in a bit more, more precise fashion? Yeah, so I mean, I can, I can comment about the, the things that we're looking at. So some of the stuff that we're interesting is about how cells are interacting. Um, so I, I come from, you know, the um, immune oncology field. We're very interested about in immune cells that are in the tissue, and we really want to know who these immune cells are talking to that is 
um, making them, you know, get the phenotype that they have. So we have immune cells with a bunch of different phenotypes in the tissue. So who are they next to? Who are they talking to when they next to is talking to? Yeah, at, at some kind of a distance, right? So you know, so you could be whispering and you could be mm -hmm. shouting. But, but yeah, so, so what was the context for these cells when they acquired these kind of phenotypes? So let's um, one, right? So it doesn't matter about the sort of more global pattern next to it. it. Yeah, but it's, but it's one cell. So, you know, I may have like one T cell and I want to see, you know, which cells were in their neighborhood and who were, th and, and what proteins these cells were expressing, what, what the phenotype of these cells. So that's one type of question that we're interested in. I think another very common question that people, again, in my field are interested in is generating predictors. So ca can we identify some sort of features that integrate together both uh, the expression data and the cell types and their spatial relationships and their morphology <laughs> kind of put all that together to say which patients are going to react well to a treatment or... or so that was burnt. That's why so that was burnt. That's why what? That's why we collect cohorts of samples. Well, that's, that's because of our feasibility at the moment. But, but yeah, but I think that's the kind of question that people are yeah, interested in, in, in going forward. I don't remember. He had a couple of hundreds. Yeah. He has a couple of hundred. But he has yeah. small fields of view from each one in order to trace yeah. that. But you want to link to some type of clinical, so I think statistics would be called like a, a, a multi-instance learning type of problem, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, and if anybody else wants to comment, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just layer on not only just cell counts and if they're talking together based on association and if that modeling that that association is not random, but that that's an en enriched population, but also layering that with the microanatomy, because we have that luxury, which we mm -hmm. don't with the disaggregated, uh, you know, the, the ex vivo or the single cell approaches, is that you can start to ask, are they next to the extracellular matrix? Are these cells adjacent to nerves? Things that you can't really capture so well. And then to find them in microanatomy, like B cell follicles or T cell zones or villi or crypts or so on. So have them down to the region, and whether we train on that or you have people physically annotate the images, this is epithelial cell, this is an intestinal crypt, so on, I mean, that could be meaningful, but that is something actually that you could train on. So those are the kinds of things that we're asking, not only cells, phenotypes, locations, neighbors, and making sure that that's a meaningful quantification. Uh, in other words, it's not random. Yeah. Uh, I would like also to, to, to think about also the ambitions of, of the ambition of the of the repository that we are trying to create and I, I would like to ask you if you just want to share the uh, for instance neuroscience researchers or uh, do you also expect that the human cellatas could also serve neurologists and um, I mean do you want to in five years or ten years do we want to combine our information with the information that is now generating the hospital? Uh, this is a question that perhaps will have also an impact on the development of algorithms, analysis, and all these things, because depending on the decision that we will take in the following months, uh, the standards and also the, the, the type of annotations that we will uh, carry out is, is very important. So, or the uh, future. So we only have 10 minutes left, and uh, we still have uh, one question. So we can uh, maybe either discuss this topic or just uh, let uh, people who have not talked about, like uh, it, uh, whatever you want to say, uh, you know, maybe something we have not covered in this uh, discussion. What do you guys think? We have only 10 minutes. So. Uh. Yeah. I'd comment rather than doing like an either or approach, like certainly the beauty of the single cell is it's high throughput, it's scalable, it's standardized across with, you know, the certain 10x genomics yeah. platform, so on. Yeah. But imaging can be complementary that maybe yeah. the cell, obviously we get spatial relationships that are missing, uh, but hard to extract rare cells where you might not have the sequencing yeah. depth, like for plasmocytodendritic cells and so on, and then the patterns. And putting that all together, I think it's yeah. better than the sum of each of its individual parts. So we can argue, yeah, that it's low throughput, but there's some advantages to be had, and that's all I would just comment. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think one, one point to stress, and I think that this is the reason why the, 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 the genomics part of, of the HCA was so successful and built such a, a community, 
is that we, we didn't make such decisions. We didn't limit ourselves. This is sort of like a narrow-minded NIH thing where we're going to choose one thing early on, uh, well before we even understand what we're doing, and then limit ourselves. So I think that what we should be doing now as these methods are being developed, both experimentally and computationally, is actually celebrate the diversity and not decide on uh, the best way or which genes or what benchmark, but we, we should first just facilitate uh, this, this sharing uh, to make it easy for each and every one of us to, to be in an exploration phase. So really, so what you said, the, the diversity also gets come back to the earlier question we have about the, the uh, you know, how do you, you uh, compare the uh, using like a comparable format, and so then it would be easier to integrate, right? So. so I think we're not at that point. The point now is it was an emerging technology. We're not at the point of let's take all these technologies and reconcile them. We're at mm -hmm. the point of let's take all these technologies, see what, we, what they can do, and what mm -hmm. we can learn. Yeah. I, and I don't think we should try and integrate at this point. I see. I disagree. <clears throat> the genomic stuff has, has a long history of being easily integratable because it has such a simple format. And the, it's simpler data. We have been doing high, we, we've been doing high resolution imaging for decades. Right. And if you go online, you can probably find 20,000 histology sections that you can actually get to online out of the millions and millions and millions that have been done. People don't share their data. If you annotate the data, we have absolutely no way of sharing that right now in a, in a robust no, way. I'm saying yeah. we should share. We should, no. we should, we should so, but let's start, let's start with the image. Let's start with the image part of it. The omics people are going to have to work out how they're going to do their omics because, and that's going to change. It's going to be different for every different kind of omics. It's going to be a different format. But the image part, the spatial part, we should be able to do right now. And it would be nice if HubMap and GoodMap and HCA and Brain and everybody else had the same it, image. We're part. talking about two th different things. One of them is a format mm -hmm. that allows us to share data and to share our annotations in an easy way. Right. This I completely support as our top priority. The other thing, which is what I think GC said, is if that someone does uh, a MIBI and someone does a MRFISH, uh, he wants to be able to overlay them and integrate them and make them in, you know, into one thing. If someone does a high-res image and, and, and a low-res image, he wants to integrate those two images so they overlay. That's the integration which I'm talking about that we're not quite ready to tackle yet. But to make every single image an image that we can share, regardless of the fact that if we take, you know, three slices and send one to Murfish, one to high res, and one to low res imaging, and then we want to, you know, completely merge those three seamlessly into one image where at each location we know exactly what's going let's, on. Let's We're not just, there yet. Let's just try to get to the point where we can actually lay the three images on top of each other and get them to occupy the same two-dimensional space. So that I, is challenging. I'm, we're not uh, yeah. there yet. I know, but let's uh, There are a couple of, there. I, I want to say that there are a couple of viewers that actually do that. Mm -hmm. I think that... Um, do that in a way that you trust them? <laughs> yes, in a way that I trust them. I, I think that what Douglas said yes, uh, earlier, the fact that they're not combining both the, annot like both the visualization and the annotation and the storage together, I think that's the big limiting thing because each one of them does one thing and you kind of have to, you know, pull your data in and out of each one of them and, and, and I think that's kind, of, that's kind of the problem. But just having multi-layered visualizers, there are a couple of those. There are a couple of those that, that exist out there and not all of them, I think, are, are accepting all formats of, you know, the images that come out of but the Just a clarification, uh, I didn't uh, yeah. advocate uh, to... Uh, Superimpose every single you know uh, imaging methods and collect a one super image. That's not, not exactly what I'm saying. All right. So, I just want to have a way that uh, when people like uh, they say, oh no, I get the. It's kind of like sharing. Right? So I have this image. We look at this way. We collect that way. Are they consistent? I mean, like just as simple as that. Any anyone? There's. We only have a few minutes. Still, some people have not talked. If you have not. 
Come on, before this will be our last chance. All right, well, I'll, I'll talk again then. Um, so <laughs> the, your last point is something we haven't talked about at all and I think is really critical to think about. So um, there's sort of biologically driven marker proteins and genes that people want to image because they know the cell type and they want to annotate it. But then as you go to these higher multiplex experiments or you start integrating data that you know is spit out of the microscope that is different information, how do you generalize that to actually call a cell type or cell subtype? Right. And so Matt's presented one possibility about how to do that in a probabilistic manner today. But I would say this is also another solved issue, and it's, a, in my opinion, a harder one than the segmentation. I actually think the transfer learning thing is going to work. But in this case, you know, you have some collection point cloud data or intensity data that you think you've segmented into a cell. It now contains markers 1 through 10 and 10 through 20 or something. How do you know that that's cell type A versus cell type B? Mm -hmm. And then particularly, how do you know it's cell type 1A versus yeah. cell type 1B kind of thing, right? And so I think, you know, in the terms of the long-term analysis, that's actually going to be something that's really valuable and something that you're going to get out of the spatial data that you don't get otherwise because you're going to be able to figure that out. So it's something to think about. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Any, any other I comments? think last comment. Yeah. Another thing to think about is getting paired data wherever is possible so that you'd have like a paired lymph node, for example, and then doing imaging and then also single cell uh, analyses because one of the projects that I'm working on is that we know that there's a distribution of T regulatory cells outside of the follicle, the B cell follicle, and that correlates to increased progression versus inside the follicle. And then we'd like to ask in TISNI space, are the T regulatory cells that we, so we see a spatial pattern in the tissue, do those T regulatory cells, do they parse differently, you know, from the ones that are located in the follicle or diffuse through the tissue? And that was where I think bringing them together would be really insightful. So um, anyway, just if wherever possible, get paired data. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that too. Anybody else? Some, some last comments? Great. We are right on time. Three o'clock. Um, OK, so I think um, I'll just uh, add that I think um, maybe following up a little bit on what Fabian said before is that one of the great things about imaging is that it really, it really allows you to connect things across different length scales, right? So you don't just get mRNA expression data. You can get mRNA expression and protein and cell and cell neighborhood and microanatomical structures and you know even gross anatomical structures. So you kind of have you know like this in really in-depth view of you know all the, all the different things that you're seeing. And I think that from the discussion today, we we really emphasize how we're really scratching scratching the surface in terms of analysis of all that. I think some of the good points that were made here today have uh, have a lot to do with how do we share the data um, um, within this community and, and how people need to start talking and thinking about it and how we can really learn from other communities who have been dealing with these things, so the pathologist community, the neuroscience community, and how we maybe get them involved in, in, the, in these efforts. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, thank you very much for coming and uh, look uh, forward to the, we try to, write up something <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to represent as well as possible. Thank you. Right. Thank you.